patriarchy, that old male caste. Let your armor rust and your weapons rot. For we'll no longer stay in our place out of your way. You better stick it in your Ripley and believe it or not. The clause as it stands says everyone, but we should be changed to every, every person. It was a cheer that was heard around the nation, the sound of sweet success. It belonged to the women of Canada, young women, old women, English and French, black, immigrant, lesbian, poor and disabled women. In Ottawa and across the country, they cheered on February 14, 1981, because they knew the weekend conference on the Constitution had laid the groundwork for equality rights for Canadian women. The ad hoc committee of women on the Constitution had accomplished the impossible. With no funds, only a few weeks, and a disconnected network, they used passion, solidarity, wit, and tenacity to write an unforgettable piece of history. The struggle began almost a century earlier with the suffrage movement, the founders claiming that the name itself was a disguise for the real purpose, which was to obtain equal rights for women. It continued into this century with the Persons case in 1929. One by one, the barriers facing women began to fall. Then in the 60s, women like Doris Anderson and Laura Sabia started encouraging women to become involved in equality seeking. I'm as well qualified as any man in my area and I will never hold the top position because I'm a woman. Their efforts led directly to the establishment of a Royal Commission on the Status of Women in 1967. Women were not wanted in the workplace at all except in uh, secretarial roles and service roles and we were all told to go home and to the suburbs and produce children and help our husbands be uh, very successful. Three years later, in September 1970, the Royal Commission handed in a report with 167 recommendations. It was the beginning of what would become the biggest heave-ho to the status quo this country had ever known. Consider that when the Commission was called for in 1967, many traditional marriage vows required that a woman promise to obey her husband. Access to birth control information was illegal. Married women couldn't open bank accounts without their husband's signatures. A woman couldn't testify against her husband for beating her. One of the immediate consequences of the Royal Commission report was an increase in women's organizations. The Advisory Council on the Status of Women was established, as was the National Action Committee on the Status of Women. In the 70s, um, I was part of a group that established the first uh, rape crisis center that established the first shelter for battered women. We became very active in daycare. The Secretary of State Women's Program was very active and, and had started and was giving money to grassroots groups and giving um, the capacity for contacting each other to women all over this very vast and dispersed country. We had a woman president of a major university, Pauline Jewett, in the 70s. We had a lot of things happening that gave us a sense of solidarity. And we were excited. Little did any of them know at the time that they were putting in place the network that would carry out an internationally historic feat, the entrenchment of equality rights for women in the Canadian Constitution. In no other country have women been as successful in securing solid legal protection. In the spring of 1980, the government announced it was bringing back Canada's constitution from Westminster in London, and that a new charter of rights and freedoms would be entrenched in it. However, before the document was signed, women realized there were problems with the wording. Due to pressure from women's organizations and other interest groups, public hearings were held before a joint committee of the House of Commons and the Senate. Nous sommes heureuses de pouvoir pour présenter un mémoire sur un projet de résolution portant adresse commune à Sa Majesté la Reine concernant la Constitution du Canada. Some of the finest, most compelling briefs were prepared by women. We pointed out that 
it was very important to say plainly, no need to get into fancy legal stuff, that men and women, or as we ultimately used male and female persons to make sure that we could cover children, that male and female persons had the right to equality under the Charter. It didn't take long to find out how seriously the government was taking their presentation. And I was just wondering why we don't have a section in here for babies uh, and children. Uh, all you girls are going to be working and uh, we're not going to have anybody to look after them. The government later responded by making substantial changes to the Charter, but a guarantee of equality rights was still missing. Doris Anderson, president of the Advisory Council on the Status of Women, had planned a national conference on women and the Constitution. To her astonishment, the minister responsible for the status of women, Lloyd Axworthy, cancelled the conference, claiming the timing was unsuitable. Doris Anderson promptly resigned her post. The journalist called me and said, well, Doris Anderson just quit. And I said, you mean they cancelled the conference? And without another thought, I just said, they don't have the right to cancel our conference. Less than a week later, the gathering began. Like a storm brewing in the distance, 12 women met in the Cow Cafe in Toronto for lunch. We basically at that point said, I don't care if there's 20 of us. We're going to Ottawa. We had no money. We had no organizing committee, really. We had nothing, and we had three weeks. And there were incredible things. You know, a meeting in Ottawa, and they, and they just passed the hat and gathered some money, and somebody said, well, who will look after this? And some stranger that nobody knew stood up and said, I'm an accountant. I'll look after it. And then, you know, it was like she walked off with the money at the end of the meeting, and everybody said, who, who was that woman? Yeah. They hoped 250, maybe 300 women would somehow get to Ottawa for the conference. When more than 1,000 turned up, they were stunned. It is really ironic that this meeting should be taking place in the room in which the Constitution has been discussed all these many months. The next 48 hours were a blur of briefs, Four resolutions, Thank you for that. arguments, Objection. votes, and at last, consensus. When Agnes McPhail was first elected to the House of Commons, she was so excited about it that she thought that she was the forerunner of a great many women coming after her. She could hear their footsteps echoing through the corridors of Parliament. Today, Agnes McPhail's projection would be vindicated. Then came the task of lobbying the parliamentarians to adopt the resolutions. We really don't understand till you're in there and you're on Parliament Hill and you're facing the politicians and their experts who say, politically, pragmatically, we've made the judgment that we've gone as far as we can on 15. And that's how Section 28 came to be. They won the single most important statement to protect women's rights in any constitution. Section 28 reads, Notwithstanding anything in this charter, all rights herein are guaranteed equally to male and female persons. In November 1981, a First Minister's Conference introduced an override accord that threatened to unravel the entire tapestry. Once again, there was a call to action. Ad hocers across the country understood the significance of that and said, get 15 and 28 out from under that override. They should be absolute fundamental rights and freedoms that women can rely on. And we failed insofar as we didn't get 15 out from under 33, but ultimately they caved in and agreed that they would exempt 28. The struggle of 81 was over. The women of Canada had prevailed. Sections 15 and 28 now had the clout to argue for change in many aspects of women's lives, employment, education, sports, family law, health, immigration, income assistance programs, and pensions. Perhaps the single most important event that followed was the founding of the Legal Education and Action Fund in 1985. It's a national organization um, devoted to using the Charter of Rights and other legal instruments to promote and achieve equality for women in Canada. The thing about LEAF as an assistance to all the other women's groups in Canada is by using the law, we had some teeth. As a matter of fact, we had some jaws. We have been involved in cases that have 
for example, um, established that uh, sexual harassment in the workplace is an injury for which there can be uh, recovery under workers' compensation acts, to establish that discrimination on the grounds of pregnancy is discrimination on the grounds of sex. To take a case to the Supreme Court of Canada can cost you anywhere between half a million and a million dollars. And there's no way any one individual woman in Canada can do this. And it had to be done on behalf of women. So LEAF sponsors test cases so that the precedent is set. In 1987, the Meech Lake Accord loomed as a major challenge to the new charter. Constitutional experts hired by women's groups pointed out it put sections 15 and 28 in jeopardy, and the chant went up again, we can afford a better accord. We are back again, and we are rallying across Canada to address our growing concerns about equality issues. We are calling for strong, for a very strong statement in the Meech Lake Accord, which guarantees equal rights, the protection and equal benefit without discrimination as was set forth in Section 15 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Today, there are 40 women out of 295 members who sit in the House of Commons, 13 women out of 104 who sit in the Senate. Most women still earn 66 cents for every dollar a man earns, and three out of four women over the age of 65 who live alone are poor. Daycare legislation has been close, but close doesn't count when there's only space for one child in ten. The issue of choice and abortion rights remains a hot potato the government can't handle. There's still a lot to do. For oh, we're coming round the mountain and we're coming round for power and we're seeing ourselves as the president. And if you fight and you scream of injustice in our dream, we'll be forced to remind you who's the 51 percent. The players on the ad hoc committee are still vigilant, checking and watching. But today they're celebrating a victory women struggled toward for 100 years and captured in a 48-hour hectic, frantic, empowering Valentine's Day conference in 1981. Nous venons vous faire face, vous décrire notre place. Reprenez vos plans construits en trompe. Ouvrez vos yeux, nettoyez vos oreilles. Il est temps que notre voix trace son chemin gamin. Feminism goes beyond just rights and, you know, all that, the, all those sort of paper things that look good on the Constitution, it goes into, you know, applicability. The movement is not as strong as it was, say, even 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and that we need to take, as women, we need to take hold of that and to see what it is that we need to do to encourage younger women who are coming up to see that this is not a fringe thing. This is not, the women's movement is not a luxury. Je suis optimiste face à l'avenir des femmes au Canada, euh, si on compare à d'autres pays. Par contre, il euh, ne faut jamais cesser d'être vigilant. On le voit tous les jours, on le voit dans les journaux, on l'entend à la radio. Les femmes ne pourront jamais cesser de se battre et de demander qu'on les reconnaisse, mais je suis optimiste. We have to focus that affirmative action should also touch women of all colors, the native women and the women of, with disabilities. And within the broader women's movement, of course, um, We've met with contradictions and conflicts, but what is important is that if we find a level of unity first, then struggle for higher levels of uh, understanding. So farewell to patriarchy, that old male caste. Oh, don't let the changes get you overwrought. Oh, no, don't shed a tear. That's too female, my dear. <laughs> Just stick it in your Ripley and believe it or not. Stick it in your Ripley and believe it or not.